The ideas and information explored in this webinar are featured in A Field Guide to Gifted Students, a teacher's introduction to identifying and meeting the needs of gifted learners. Ideal for book talks, professional learning circles, and in-service training, the kit includes 10 full-color books and a complimentary facilitator's guide. Available from proofrock.com. So let me introduce our two speakers who are the two authors and illustrator of the book. Uh, Charlotte Agal is the, an author and illustrator of 14 books for children and young adults. Uh, she's a longtime public school teacher, uh, almost two decades of experience in gifted instructional support. Uh, she came to gifted education after a background in, in English language learning and language acquisition. She was GT Teacher of the Year for the Maine Educators of the Gifted and Talented. She has a master's degree from Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, welcome, Charlotte. Thanks for being here. It is. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. It's really great to be here. And as a Swedish person who grew up in Hong Kong and came to the States just for college, special hello to the whole world, which is apparently out there. I did want to say that I spent today teaching. It was a fully remote day for me. So hence, just briefly, I have some props because um, as we talk about this book, I'm just fully aware that you know, we're talking about it from inside a pandemic, and that's going to influence a lot about this conversation, even if I hope the conversation is much bigger than the pandemic. And the second thing I'm just throwing up there is my husband, who has a total green thumb, knows exactly when to be brutal and how sometimes that is the way to go. And he was pruning this beautiful jade tree, and I'm like, oh my God. But he said, if you just put this in earth, which I'll find someone to do. Um, ours was taking over the room. If you put this in earth, it will just thrive. And I feel like in some way that could be metaphorical for what we're trying to do for our GT kids. This looks like, oh my goodness, but given the right conditions, this will thrive. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to talk to my uh, friend and, and former colleague, Molly, and you. Well, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte, and thanks for the the the, the example props. That's that's fantastic. And uh, let me let me welcome Molly Kellogg. Uh, Molly is a teacher and consultant for over twenty years in education, ten years in in gifted. She has a master's degree from our folks, uh, for our friends at UConn. She is uh, she was also GT Teacher of the Year for the Maine Educators uh, of the Gifted and Talented. So, well, welcome, Molly. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here speaking with you and Charlotte and um, all of the teachers out there who are working with us today. Um, it's really exciting in this world of distance learning right now to really connect with other teachers in so many different places. You know, I miss going to the conferences in person and teaching in the real school and working with teachers doing workshops like live. Um, so this is a really wonderful way to connect um, today, I was not doing distance learning. I was doing learning in person with my four-year-old son, um, who <laughs> was home today with me uh, when he's not at his outdoor preschool. Um, and I constantly realize how much I've learned from teaching that I'm applying to parenting. So <laughs> it's an adventure and I'm excited to be here talking about kids and uh, learning and our book today. Oh, great, great. Oh, well, thanks, thanks, Molly. Let me, let me, uh, talk a little bit about this book before I move into a talk to asking you guys questions about it. Let me show you a, a page from Dr. Joseph Renzulli's uh, uh, Scales for Rating the, uh, the Behavioral Characteristics of Superior Students, what I, I call the Renzulli Scales because of what you just heard me do. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tongue twister. He, he has a lot of scales that if a, a kid exhibited certain behaviors to a high degree, uh, they're, they're likely to be superior students. And so you can look through here, here's the communication characteristics. And so th these are the behaviors that you might see a kid that has th these kind of expressive abilities uh, exhibiting in a classroom. Now you wouldn't want to use this for an introduction to, to gifted kids. It's a little bit more clinical. It's a little more dry. This is, this is more of obviously a, a, an instrument. But what, what Charlotte and Molly have done is instead of giving folks, you know, uh, sort of dry characteristics of, of these kids, what they have done, and let me take you over to an example of one of the pages from the book. 
Here is uh, Quinn. He's the explainer. Well, if you look at Quinn, his verbal and ex expressive abilities, the precision of, of, of his abilities uh, match up with a lot of those behavior characteristics that Dr. Renzulli mentioned. So what, what, what Molly and Charlotte have done is created um, a wonderful narrative approach to what, what are these characteristics and then how would we serve a kid who has those characteristics. So in this case, the, the, the structure of each of these profiles, there's 12 profiles in the book, uh, is uh, we, we come in with a little, a little descriptive narrative uh, we look at the way we interact with Quinn and the way Quinn interacts in a classroom. We look then at tips for working with Quinn, and then we have field notes. So the facilitator then, this is an open-ended discussion about, about, about Quinn, the nature of the, the talent that Quinn has, and then how do we serve uh, Quinn in the classroom. We've, and again, we've got 12 of these profiles. And I, I wanted to turn uh, and ask Molly and Charlotte, because this is such a clever idea, instead of approaching this from a dry sort of, here are the five things about gifted kids that you should know, you've, you've approached it from a, a wonderfully creative narrative, fully illustrated book approach. Uh, talk about how this, this project came about. Well, I think Charlotte and I had a similar thought that, that you just did, Joel, which is we had a tool. Um, and when we were working together in the schools um, with uh, elementary and middle school learners um, in gifted programs and classroom teachers as well, we um, found from a colleague a tool with 12 common characteristics of giftedness. And the tool was actually set up in a very clever way to show teachers, well, what does you know, abstract, superior abstract thinking skills look like in the classroom in a potentially positive way or a potentially negative way that could be challenging in a classroom setting? And the word, the, the language was really helpful, but it was a collection of words on the page. And we thought, how can we bring this tool to life so that teachers can see what it looks like in real kids? What do these characteristics look like in real kids in our classrooms? And so we decided, well, let's take these 12 common characteristics and create some fictional children that um, exemplify these characteristics. Not because there are only 12 categories of giftedness or 12 kinds of gifted learners, but just as representatives. And so we created these narratives to describe these fictional children. And then Charlotte created these amazing illustrations and we turned it into a workshop for our teachers. So we would bring the, the kids and the teachers would actually get to talk about the kids based on the little descriptions we have about their personalities and would talk about, well, what if Olive was in my classroom? What would I do to make her successful? And we started doing the workshop in so many places that we decided maybe there was a better way to reach more educators than just our workshop. Right, so we had so much fun with the workshop. We did it in parts of New England, mostly in Maine, but also elsewhere. And, um, you know, people kept asking for materials. So we had this kind of not so great or professional website. And then I think it was like one of those Molly Charlotte moments where we, we live in the same town. We looked at each other and like, we have an idea. What if we, you know, got it to be a better resource than just our kind of crappy website. So we got to work on um, fledging this out and, and thinking about it from different angles, how it could be useful as professional development um, in a very introductory way, you know, just in the way where uh, someone who might be very new to, to GT Ed. I, I think about actually my own teacher education coming from a background of, we used to call it ESL, ELL. When I first uh, became a GT teacher, I was doing the certification as I went along. It was very heady and wonderful. Um, and I realized that in my sort of general ed classes, I might have had 15 minutes on, on the topic. And I, I was so unversed in it that when my very own daughter who came downstairs reading at three and a half, I was like, wait, um, you know, I just didn't, almost didn't have a framework for that, let alone in my, in my own classroom. So um, we had fun with it. And not to say that fun is the operative word, but I think it's professional development where, um, where almost everybody says, oh, I know that kid, even though these are fictitious kids. Um, you probably have met some of them. <laughs> And Charlotte had the great idea too in that framework of introduction to add that field notes part at the end of each narrative because what we're hoping is that very much like the workshops that we created, teachers will say, oh, I have a kid kind of like that or kind of like these three kids combined. Mm -hmm. Here's what I tried that really worked. Here's what I tweaked. 
here's what was helpful so that the next group of kids come along and you know, you've added to the strategies in the book and it becomes an even richer resource for you. And neither of us are actually birders, but we like birds. And so the whole notion of a field guide um, came about because it's sort of an obvious, you know, visual plus um, identifying factors plus habitat. So we, we played with that throughout as a kind of, we hope not too oppressive organizing metaphor. Um, the whole point of it is almost like when you see that first rare bird, you're like, whoa, that's a different one. Um, in fact, it repeats, I'm, I'm going to read, um, but it repeats in the book. We're hoping that teachers uh, new to this or old hands at this will, will um, read the book and say about the child in, in, in your classroom, I see you, I understand your needs. I can begin to meet your needs this way. You know, just uh, that goes a long way, I think, with any of us human beings. If somebody sees us for who we are, it's immediately calming and you can open yourself to feeling seen and as if your education is about to really happen. Um, so that was our whole premise of the field guide sort of thing. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Let, let me share with the audience the, the table of contents of the book so they get a sense of the different, the different kids you introduce. And I was, I was thinking through, okay, if I could make a, a really great creative book a little dull, I, <laughs> I went through and thought, well, what are, what are some of the qualities that these kids each you know, represent. So you, you guys talk about kids with exceptional memory. You talk about kids that are able to make connections uh, amongst, ba basically make generalizations very easily uh, and, and make the connections of, of different facts and information and draw larger conclusions. You, you're talking about kids with uh, 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 powerful verbal skills uh, who love wordplay and love playing with language. Uh, you, you talk about kids who love to be engaged and are motivated with learning. Uh, voracious readers and, and quick learners, uh, kids who have tight focus, uh, kids who have leadership skills. Um, I would say I was trying to characterize one as just, it's almost data awareness. They, the kids who can walk into a room and perceive a difference or pick up uh, an emotion from another kid or see, just see the small details and, and draw conclusions. Uh, kids who are perfectionists, uh, kids who have um, uh, who are creative thinkers. And then also kids, you have one at the end that I thought was wonderful, was it just someone who's truly clever and their yeah. their humor is sophisticated. They're, they're just, they are, they're an old soul uh, uh, kind of character. And again, all of these are amalgams of different qualities of gifted kids, um, I, I, I thought maybe I, I would ask you when you were when you've worked with gifted kids in the past, what of these qualities most stands out for you that that we have to make adaptations for kids in the classroom of, of the qualities of gifted kids? What keeps us as teachers most on our toes? I, I'm just going to. I just had somehow. Um... Turn to this page. We have some quotes in our book. Some are online, some are in the resources and references. And I love this quote from Silverman. Perfectionism is the life partner of giftedness. It takes an abstract mind to strive for an ideal that is seldom if ever found in concrete reality. Frequently maligned in psychology, there's more to this characteristic than meets the eye. Perfectionism is a different animal at each stage of development. And I would argue it's a different animal in each individual's manifestation thereof. So. Um, it, it, to me, that's like if you were, you know, kind of finding a common core of all of them. That's not to say every single gifted person or child is, is blessed and slash afflicted with perfectionism, just like our, um, the characteristic scale we worked from has positive and negative attributes. I think, you know, every gift has its price and maybe perfectionism mm -hmm. is the blessing and the price of a I lot of giftedness. <laughs> So I have I have two great authors, Jill Adelson and, and uh, Hope uh, Hope Wilson, that did a book on uh, a perfectionism for us, and it was many years ago. Did it, and I took it home to to my parents. Again, this is a long time ago. My dad's passed away since then, but uh, brought brought. I wanted to show him that that book, and he was an old brigadier general. I mean, he was somebody who you know he achieved, you know. And he looked at the title. He said, "Well, I don't understand what's wrong with perfectionism," <laughs> you know. And it's true, you know. There there it there are two sides of these things and you know some of the most most uh, ach achievement oriented folks we have in our classroom tend to have some perfectionistic qualities it's kind of brutal though when you're up with your personal child at midnight begging them to do their worst work 
for school the next day. It just, you know, like, no. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely agree. I feel like Charlotte and I are always talking about perfectionist elements of, of, you know, many of our students and how to support them. I think as teachers, you know, who, we, who keeps us on our toes the most? I definitely agree with Charlotte. I have a hard time picking between Sadie the Maverick, partially because she's so driven and over such an overachiever and so independent that she just runs away with all our ideas and steamrolls everybody else sometimes if she's an extroverted sort of maverick, uh, as ma many mavericks are. And that can be very challenging um, as a teacher with many students in the classroom. So teaching a Sadie how to honor their, you know, 58 part project idea, um, but also how to work with others collaboratively and how to, you know, create a an interesting project in two weeks instead of the two years that her thesis would you know would would take um and as as charlotte's picture shows you know maybe not sew all the costumes and make all the sets and sing you know write all the songs and um for the little play that you want to do to demonstrate the story your teacher read aloud um so i think definitely a sadie would would keep you on your toes but also i think liam the sensitive soul i think one of the things that um, some teachers who are not, um, have not had that many experiences working with gifted kids um, realize is the um, intensity of the sensitive nature of many gifted learners, um, even if it doesn't show up on the surface. So understanding um, how, get, how stimuli from the environment, whether it's a sad friend or seeing a piece of litter on the ground or hearing about kids who don't have fresh water every day can really af deeply affect even a young gifted learner. Um, and I think raising the awareness in adults is really important about a learner like that because you don't realize you have to be on your toes with a sensitive soul, but you do need to be, and, and that, you need to be checking in with them. That I agree so much. And that brings me to something that we both think about a lot, which is the predominance really, I guess statistically, if by a smidge of um, introverted GT folk. And that, you know, means that, you know, they might not stick out. They might prefer hiding in that book. Um, it also, if you start to do some research about uh, introverted people, they're more likely to use long-term memory thought processes to retrieve information that can take a while. So what happens then in that quick give and take of the Zoom classroom or the actual classroom. Um, there's a lot of, of you know, thinking of how can I meet this person and have the conversation that they need, but um, you know, do it on their terms too, because that could be a shy bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to think of, uh, like, uh, like, so you'd have e introverts and extroverts in your classroom, and the extroverts, you'd ask a question, and uh, immediately hands would shoot up. And I, th there are kids who will throw their hand up, and they have no idea, <laughs> you know, but they'll start talking. And, th and then they're also socially skillful enough that they watch your face, and they watch as, as they start molding the answer. And then somehow verbally, they, they finally reach the point where they've got this fantastic answer uh all the the time that that introvert comes to that same answer but it's an internal process and it's very frustrating that there's only one kid in that room that, that you know got yeah. the floor for that that process yeah, and sometimes the conversation whips by because maybe it's it's cursory level not so deep and that person misses the chance to make the deep connection that we'd all be floored by but it just you know they almost kind of forget listening to their peers what had come to them. And I think that kind of learner is really one of the motivators that we had for creating the workshop in the book because when we talk to teachers who aren't as familiar with working with gifted learners um, or you know they might just have a, an idea in their mind that it's the overachiever, the person who loves school, their hand is always up, they're very verbal, they're comfortable presenting and talking in front of groups and you can see their verbal precociousness, you can hear it all the time. Um, but what about those quiet thinkers, you know, who may be more introverted or they just digest internally a lot more um, and they very much could be gifted learners too, or maybe they've tuned out because they're so disengaged with learning that's a mismatch for them. They're bored, they're underachievers. And we want to make sure that people understand how diverse giftedness yeah. is. Not, not just diverse, but also, I mean, gifted kids can be at huge risk, you know, combine it 
um, let's say you're LGBTQ and gifted, that's a really high risk category. Um, and uh, you want to be aware, I mean, it's, it's like the common misconception of, of trying to engage people talking about needs of the gifted is like fundraising for the Rockefellers. Probably people have heard that old joke, but just come, you know, steering people to knowing what is the difference between a wonderful, bright, hardworking, school adapted child, which some GT kids can be, and um, and you know the, the true outlier is the GT kids who do not present that way and can easily be be lost um, to to us. Yeah, I golly, that boy, that just brings up so many memories from from teaching. I, I in my gifted classroom, you know, I had the 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 senior class president, and a girl that pretty much every day came in, kind of rolled up in a, a fetal ball, and 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 was, I mean, she was brilliant, but but she just this was a painful experience, school and being around other people. So you just had these these two diametrically uh, different kids, uh, and. and Interpersonally now, intellectually, of course, they were both astounding. Um, let me let me ask you guys this, and I, I, this wasn't something we talked about before, but I was thinking. I think we have, you know, we have uh, a lot of folks who came to this webinar, some of whom are trainers of new teachers, but some are, you know, new to gifted education, and we're curious about this introduction to to teaching gifted. What are some uh, what were if you had advice to give to a teacher new to working with gifted kids? What Kind of what's off the top of your head that you'd tell a teacher? Well, I, one thing I would say is find an ally. I felt very lucky to not be alone in my work because sometimes it can be a misunderstood, you know, whether it's an administrator, another teacher, another teacher in a different district, somebody with whom you can kind of deconstruct what's going on, get some support from, uh, get, get yourself a Molly. <laughs> get, get a partner. Um, yeah, and, and I would say, also um, to do the things that you know are best practices for all teachers and um, but do them in a very you know as in a very broad way so you know all teachers start the year getting to know their kids okay so how many different ways can you do that you know besides the get to know you games can you provide a questionnaire that has really interesting questions like if you could apprentice yourself to anyone over the summer who would it be if you could you know craft your own project for the next month what, what would it be? And you know, all kids love answering those questions, but having a fourth grader say they would apprentice themselves you know, to you know, a, a, a local business person is very different than someone who names a specific herpetologist um, that they know because they have watched so many adult made specials for, you know, by the right. science. Plus they know the word herpetology. So that's right. That's so, um, <laughs> um, so, you know, how many different ways can you get to know your students initially and um, so that you can start to draw out who, where those gifted learners are. Um, and then I would say just what Charlotte said, as soon as you can align yourself with a partner, um, as soon as you go to a website like Proof Rock Press or your local gifted association, you'll find so many resources too, just to initiate yourself mm -hmm. with some general information. And even though sometimes it feels like gifted programs fly under the radar, there are so many educators out there who want to connect with new teachers. So reaching out and finding your, your local state organization um, or you know, even or the national, national organizations. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, also to, to think about, sure, you know, gifted programs, but we don't, you know, in some districts there are no real programs. It's not necessarily a daily thing. In our district, it was a bit helpful when we, we categorized it as uh, GT instructional support. And you think of it as like, what does this child need? The way you would think about uh, kids who might have special ed needs. And sometimes they're the same kids since we do talk about twice exceptionality. Um, you know, what does this child need in terms of instructional support and is part of it GT instructional support that kind of makes it less of like some anointing process for people with loud parents to you know, something that a kid actually needs. And I would say to piggyback off of what Sharon said, like um, organizations like the National Association for Gifted Children on their website, they have a wonderful advocacy piece with lots of resources. So if you need to get an administrator on board or other educators you know, to explain why you need a gifted program or just why you need services for this one child, um, it helps you frame it in a services framework, just like our special ed services are provided and also gives lots of data that's really helpful for people who say, but I, I think, aren't there needs being met? 
you know, with everybody else in the classroom? Why do they need something special or different? Um, which can be really helpful if you're just starting out, if you're the only person in the school who's advocating for this child or, or, ki or kids, that can be helpful too. Yeah. Uh, the, to yeah. Oh, sorry, to quote Galbraith, I'm just quoting from our book, but it's the brilliant minds we added in. Um, are gifted kids really that different? Yes, they really are. They're often so much more of everything than other kids their age, more intense, curious, challenging, frustrating, sensitive, passionate. They know so much more. They learn so much faster. They feel so deeply. I, I, I had two questions that I, I wanted to get to. One, you mentioned twice exceptional learners. So I, I, I do want to touch on that. But I, one of the things that I was thinking about as I was looking through the profiles uh, in your book is the kid that learns more quickly than other kids. And, and for me, as I was, I was, I was a high school English teacher, and it, one of the I think that was one of the challenges, that one of the hardest things to do with is when you've got a kid who's, you know, moving three times faster than the other kids in the classroom. And how do you modify the, the, that kid's uh, content, the rate of that they're learning at, um, modify the content that they're exposed to, uh, while you've got other kids in 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 the room that are, you know, on on grade level. What is that a challenge for you guys? Do you think that? How do you address that in in your classrooms? Well, I want to say that, you know, teachers are asked seven impossible things during the first period, you know, <laughs> misquote Alice in Wonderland. Um, so it is impossible, but worthy. I think it boils down to like the child needs to know you see them, you understand their needs and you are beginning to meet their needs. It will take a village. You might come up with a mentor. Um, it depends on the subject. You might compact. You might ask them not to, you know, let's say it's math, not do the 20 problems for homework you know they could do with you know, in their sleep, but instead do two of them and then maybe provide some extra credit. It takes a lot of different types of creative um, thinking, but um, it's, it's also, I call it impossible. I mean, that sounds awful, but it's, it's challenging. It's a lot to ask. And, and, and one of the delights of my job is, is, is helping teachers do that as I don't have, you know, a classroom. But what do you say, Molly? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I would say, you know, in, in what Charlotte is mentioning as examples are also a point that we make in the book that you do have to know the kid. Obviously, how you modify things is different for every single kid. Um, and there are some kids, let's take a high school English, you know, um, class, for example. And if you say, okay, we're focusing on Hamlet, you know, for the next six weeks, and they not only plow through it, but they understand it, they digest it, um, will enjoy diving into other versions of Hamlet, other ways of portraying it, maybe other Shakespearean plays. They will enjoy all those other pieces, but we have to be very careful about not just adding more yeah. and about replacing what's inappropriate. So uh, sometimes adding other elements is great. Like, would you like to do an author study? For some kids would be, it's so exciting. They would love that. Um, but for some kids, it's recognizing that what you're providing for the class is really inappropriate for them just level wise to begin with and figuring out to replace it with. So the math example was a great one. Um, a lot of math teachers I've worked with have loved the um, hardest first activity. You know, where I say, okay, you want the kids to do these 20 problems. You taught the skill. Could you allow the students to choose to do the two hardest first? And if they get it right, don't make them do the other 18 they don't know. Instead, have them work on this one big meaty problem. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, that's, I think, a key too is figuring out, uh, you know, what's appropriate for each child. And that's where also what Har Charlotte mentioned is so important having a partner is helpful. Like if you're, a typical third grade classroom teacher having another third grade teacher that you can collaborate with to say okay what's the big meaty problem we're going to give those three kids who really don't need the 18 practice problems let's develop it together and we'll share it you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. you know it, it, please just sorry. never say uh, oh you'll learn that next year please just never say that <laughs> yeah and and joel actually when you mentioned pace that immediately brought me to one thing that I'm very um, pleased that, that some districts allow is acceleration, which has many forms. But if you think of the, the one that most people think of, it's moving kids up to the next um, grade level in a specific subject or all subjects. So let, math is a common, um, a common example. So if you have a fifth grader who can do seventh grade math, and they know the majority of the material that is about to be taught in fifth and sixth grade, it's appropriate to place them in seventh grade math. As long as you understand, they're still gonna learn faster. 
than the other seventh grader sitting in that class, even if it's an accelerated class. And so, you know, that's, I think, something people are still surprised by. They're like, oh, well, we accelerated them. It's harder math. So we're meeting their needs. But and they might be um, quite typically asynchronously developed. So while their brains will be doing all this math that I could never figure out, um, you know, some emotional parts of them and other parts of them may be significantly behind. And that's the interesting puzzle of a GT person, kid. Yeah, it, I, I wanted to pull a quote from your, your book. You were really talking about, you know, uh, identifying and, and then serving gifted kids. But you said, although standardized tests and other formal assessments will often be an ally, there's no substitute for a teacher with an informed radar and practical experience. And, you know, we're, that example that Molly gave of the acceleration, you, you are the advocate for that kid at that moment and notice that they're moving so quickly ahead that they, they could be moved up a grade level. And, as long, and then, well, depending on the school, you may have to advocate for that because you know right. goodness knows there's sometimes pushback for the, the most well-researched strategy in gifted education in terms of effectiveness but uh, right. acceleration um, right. let me ask you guys to talk a little bit because y'all you guys do touch upon twice exceptional gifted learners in in the book could could you talk a just touch a little bit about that well i love leading with with anecdotes clearly you saw the book um and uh i'm just thinking of a twice an exceptional um kiddo who has significant EF uh, issues, spends quite a lot of time trying to be organized in our wonderful learning center. But um, let's just say that this kiddo last year when we suddenly on March 13th went completely remote, um, we had a you know basically month long discussion about war and peace and only one of us had read it and it wasn't me. You know, I had to sort of get it. So it's, it's just like the, the, the the needs are both there. I guess that's a very blunt thing to say. And so often at school, we focus on remediation and the true needs, the supporting of, of the true needs that exist in terms of catching kids up, but everyone deserves a chance to be also supported for their gifts. And twice exceptional kids should be recognized also for the gift part. Yeah. yeah we I'm sorry, Molly, I, I just wanted to mention one of my favorite authors, uh, other than the present company, uh, it, it is Dewey Rossetti. She she wrote this book um, called uh, Parenting Bright Kids Who Struggle in School, and she talks about this concept of a jagged profile. Kids who have a, a you know real strength in, in, in literacy, but then they tank in a math classroom or, or they're unmotivated, you know, and, and, and I think most of us have a jagged profile. It may just be more extreme in some cases. Uh, sorry, sorry, Molly, I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, no, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree. And, and that's, you know, that asynchronous piece that Charlotte was talking about, you know, because gifted learners are so high in certain skill sets or certain subject areas, the gaps are so much larger between, you know, maybe just average skills or, or below average. And I think Charlotte mentioned also another important point that it's really important for schools and families to focus on a strength-based approach. Yes, they need support in what they're struggling in. Um, obviously, they need to bulk up those skills um, and also need to be acknowledged for the fact that they have great strengths in some areas. So if they're a very strong mathematician, hey, utilize that passion and skill that they have to help them work on their areas of need. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think of a couple of students that I've had. I had a student who was extremely verbally precocious, a very um, high reader, amazing ideas. Um, her ability to get words on a page, uh, that was a huge struggle for her. Um, and using technology was somewhat helpful, but she once said to me, and I couldn't believe she could articulate this, but she said, by the time I've typed the, the first sentence, my brain is already seven sentences ahead. And I, I can't, keep up with that you know i can't keep that pace and that's why writing an essay means that it's about a paragraph by you know and with an hour's worth of work because it's exhausting for me to slow my brain down to keep up with my ability to get the words on the page um so giving her support and getting her her ideas out verbally or on the page was essential but it was also essential for me to say sometimes just talk to me just tell me where your ideas are and your amazing story. Let me record it. Let me worry about the pace because we need to focus on um, the amazing story that you are weaving right now. You know, yeah. um, And so I think that was really important because it gave her the message Charlotte mentioned. Like, I see that you 
have amazing ideas as a writer and that you that you are a writer and you're you know, and that you're very capable at that um even though she was also struggling um so i think that you know that that strength-based approach is really really important and also acknowledging um, the fact that kids need to learn about themselves. So let's tell you about what, where you need to work and why your brain is the way it is and why it feels like, but wait, I know everything and all these other subjects. Why am I struggling in this other thing? Am I, am I not really smart? Yeah. So helping them understand how their brains work and also helping them use their strengths as they bulk up their areas of need. I, I, I love what you're saying about metacognition, about kids needing to learn who they are as learners. I think it can be really helpful and also interesting to most GT kids. And sort of as a corollary to that, it's pretty uh, wonderful if you can uh, in some way get GT kids together because they can get each other's jokes, even if they're vastly different. You know, they often feel like they have deviance fatigue to quote, I think it's James Webb. Like they, they, they feel like, well, why is everybody talking about that? I want to talk about something, you know, like physics or in fourth grade. Um, if there's any way, you know, to have lunch groups or GT support groups um, about just so kids can realize like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the only one. The, uh, so I know that the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock has many different themes, uh, but the, the one that, that I named the company because of was this, this, this line that reoccurs through the poem of And the Women Come and Go, speaking of Michelangelo, and he just sits there. He feels incapable of talking about it, uninterested in talking about it, isolated and alone. And, and I think that is a, a, can feel like a theme if everyone else, if you're a gifted kid. We used to run a, 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 a summer camp at, at Baylor University for, for gifted high schoolers to come in and, and do creative problem solving th with real problems and they'd resolve them after going to expert sessions and whatnot. But over and over again, the comment at the end was the reason that the kids felt the conference was so valuable. Many of these kids came from little rural communities where they were the only gifted kid in, in the school is they were like, this is the first time I've ever been able to work with kids just like me. And I felt like I was a part of something and it, it was so profound, you know, and it was just like every time you read those, you got chills. Yeah. They're like, this is my tribe. This is right. my tribe. Like I or finally, yeah. Or to go with the field guide thing, this is like my flock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's that's exactly right. I, I've got uh, one other question, but let me let me take a, a pause before I ask it and encourage everyone to take some time to go into the Q and A box to pose any questions. All of you, please go into that Q and A box and upvote any questions you definitely want Stephanie to get to uh, before the end of the the session. Uh, and then, I, I, so I'm going to ask the next question. I'll do a little a marketing. I'm going to show the cover of the book and and also give uh, Charlotte and and Molly's contact information. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over and start a Q&A with the audience. So if you guys will actively participate in that Q&A section, I would sure appreciate it. Um, so uh, Molly and Charlotte, I mean, there's no easy solution as we have had so many kids move to virtual learning and blended learning and, and all of that. Um, so I'm not expecting you to give any, you know, easy answer. Here's the, here's the five things that will make this whole thing successful, you know, but you are out in the schools and, and you, you have prepared this, this, this book about gifted kids. What, what kind of advice would you give folks who are out there virtually uh, teaching with, with gifted students? Uh, right now, yeah, in the virtual world, it's it's like a double-edged sword. I think it's um, disastrous and painful and hard, and you have to, that's a negative, obviously, you have to realize that gifted kids feel things keenly. I found myself answering an email from a parent of a very gifted fifth grade girl. She was emailing both the classroom teacher and me, you know, saying that on our fully remote days, this child you know, just has meltdowns. And we, in the email, addressed all sorts of things like work completion and things that would be helpful. And then I found myself saying like, well, if, you know, I, I feel like a meltdown is kind of a realistic reaction actually, you know, to just acknowledge that this is a sensitive kid, this is a sensitive time. Um, the other edge of the sword, the maybe more positive edge is that it's a great time for being able to really cut to the chase. If we can't reimagine education right now, we are missing an opportunity because this situation is asking us to ask kids really to do only, it's almost like everyone should have an IEP. That's not gonna happen right now, it's too much to learn. But this time is also a time in history where we can say, let's take a look at what GT kids and all kids need and, and maybe we can reimagine it, get rid of some of just the random hoop jumping and go for 
the projects that really let your spirits and academics soar. Yeah, and I would say the, just to add on to that, you know, I'm seeing as a parent, you know, I see what my child is doing as well and distance learning. And I think I, I keep going back to the best practices for teaching in any format, like giving kids choices, um, giving kids authentic learning experiences with engaging material, which I, which I, I know is, is, a, is a high standard, you know, especially when teachers are learning all sorts of new technology tools and juggling a million things on their plates that they've never experienced before. Like teaching their own kids at home. <laughs> right. Um, you know, but, you know, what I'm seeing is, you know, when there are choices of, of you know, kind of the basic differentiation um, that, you know, that you might have learned about in, in uh, Carolyn Tomlinson's books, like, you know, what is the format you would like to present this information to me? You know, you're, you're providing the kids with the control to show you what they can really do and they can really run with it. You know, if you allow them to use photography and video and art and, you know, and literature and writing and, and, um, and really mold things in a way that might be harder to do in a classroom. You know, they can each do it their own way from home and you don't have to necessarily oversee all of those formats in your classroom at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, keeping those things in mind, like, okay, what are the tenets of differentiation? Cause that's what I'm doing for all my learners, not just my gifted learners. Um, and, you know, how can I provide the choice and the authentic learning in these tools that we're using right now? Um, and I think that is uh, gonna be really helpful for classroom teachers. That oh, said, great. I have to admit that if, like my first month of teaching, I was spending way too much energy kind of grieving what I couldn't do, you know? Yes, I think we all did that, especially, well, it, period, you know, back starting in, in March, it was just like, wow, this is, you know, I live in one of the f most fabulous cities in the country, Austin, Texas, and suddenly all, a lot of the things that were so great about Austin, you couldn't do, the, the music venues were shut down, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's there has been a mourning process, but, but I, I know, I'm sorry, we're talking about, not me, <laughs> we're talking about teaching, but let me, let me grab the screen back and, and, uh, uh, pull up the, the the book that we've been talking about is a field guide to gifted students, a teacher's introduction to identifying and meeting the needs of gifted learners. This is fully illustrated, full color. Each of these books is 32 pages long. It provides a profile of, of a different gifted child, 12 different uh, profiles that uh, include a narrative about the, the child, some uh, how the child interacts in a classroom, and, and, and then some tips for teachers. And it's really a discussion starter. And the reason I say that is that there is also provided with each set of 10 of these books, we provide a, a, a complimentary online facilitator's guide. So think of this as a book study. Think of this as a discussion group that you would do with, with teachers, particularly teachers who are, are new uh, to gifted kids but I think because it, this is such a humanistic approach where instead of a list of characteristics, you really get a profile of a child. I think this would be a fantastic book for, for all teachers uh, in, your, in your school. Let me also take you over to contact information for our two uh, presenters today. Um, and I, I can't leave this up too long, but if you just take a, a screenshot of it so that you can, um, you'll have a record of, of these two email addresses that you can uh, contact our speakers with. If you have any questions or uh, concerns uh, following the webinar, feel free to, uh, to, to email uh, Charlotte or Molly. So without further ado, let me turn this webinar over to Stephanie. Stephanie will be running the, the Q&A section. Please feel free to keep adding questions in there and then please upload questions because uh, uh, we've got a lot. So uh, Stephanie, feel free to uh, take over. All right. So uh, our first question uh, is, how do you support teachers who already feel overworked in mixed ability classrooms? They often feel that they don't have the time to focus on these students or they don't have the time to pretest. I, I would just lead with um, that this is a very common situation. And I wish I had a really great, quick, here's the answer. To go back to that thing that is, um, to go back to the quote that I was reading earlier, I see you, I understand your needs, I can begin to meet your needs this way. What I like to tell teachers I work with is that if you even can only differentiate and really pay attention to this child in one unit per year, I mean, it'd be great if it were all the units, but that way they know that you see them and you can enlist the child learner as, 
as advocate and ally in a sense. You know, once you build that rapport, it, it, if you, you know, clearly can't differentiate every single unit to just begin to, to acknowledge that you see them and that they have these other needs. What do you say, Molly? Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I think that one of the reasons why teachers feel so overwhelmed thinking about how to meet the student's need is that they're thinking, I have to change everything. Right. I have to change everything right now. And I'm thinking of, you know, when I was teaching fifth grade, I was teaching all the subjects. So to think, you know, even though my, my advanced learners weren't gifted in every single area, you know, it wasn't uncommon for them to need something different in reading and writing or, you know, math and science. And, and so to think like, well, great. Now I have to pretest them on every unit. I have to transform everything and create a separate project. That is very overwhelming. But, you know, again, if you have, you know, at least one compatriot, one other teacher who can collaborate with you and you can split the work. And also, I mean, as Charlotte said, just to, to actually touch base with the child and say, I see that you need something else and I'm working on that. I'm going to provide this thing that's different. And sometimes you'll do the same thing as everybody else, um, because that's what I can do right now. Um, and then, you know, we'll circle back around, you know, and uh, the next time that, I, you know, that I can um, create something different to meet your needs. Um, but I would also say, um, I sometimes teachers just need reassurance that um, just uh, in making the time up front to do a little pre-testing, which might even just be a, a conversation with a student or, you know, a written math pretest, test um, and re reminding them that if you can just make a short slice of time in the beginning of the math unit or to do that, it'll save you so much time on the back end. Because instead of getting all those parent emails, like my child's bored, they're not engaged, they just finished this. Oh, and then you're up late at night trying to create something different on the fly. Like that's stressful and extremely time consuming. So, you know, it, I know that it feels hard to fit that in, but sometimes it actually saves you more time in the long run just to check in with them ahead of time to say, okay, you already know about cells. You don't have to do the six week unit on that we're doing. Okay. And instead you know what, I've got a colleague at the high school who's going to connect you with some resources and you're going to create your own project. Like that's what we're going to do instead. And now I don't have to struggle through six weeks of you complaining that this is all boring. Yeah. One thing to not do, I mean, do it in small doses, but you know, don't turn that child into your co-teacher because kids, you know, will rightly say like, I'm so tired of having to be the teacher. I came to school to learn. I mean, they might not articulate it that way. That doesn't mean that you can't occasionally say like, Hey, share this, you know, cool thing with everybody but to just don't take that approach to, to it. Absolutely. And also um, you can also just engage the student and say, okay, so you're telling me that you're really not excited about this unit coming up because you know, it's, it's all about uh, science fiction and you love science fiction. So you've read all the books eight times. What would you like to do? Tell me what you would like to do. I, I'm going to tell you the four things that I'm focusing on that I want all my kids to learn let's talk about something you would like to do and how we can meet those same goals, you know? And sometimes the students have great ideas. You don't have to always be the one who's creating it. Yeah. And sometimes that's a relief to know that as well. Great. Uh, another question here. Uh, what advice do you have for teachers who are overwhelmed because some of their GT students have fallen behind due to COVID loss? So students are struggling to see their gifts and potential this year. I wonder if some of that can be due to uh, time spent spinning existential wheels. You know, a lot of GT kids are thinking such big thoughts about now. And um, maybe to acknowledge that is a good start. Maybe to ask for what is only key. Maybe to reinforce that this is a very odd time. I mean, that's a really great question. Um, it sort of is an echo of, of the first question because the enormity of it is enormous. <laughs> well, and I think what you said, Charlotte, just now, and also when you're talking about that fifth grade student who had a breakdown, um, the acknowledge acknowledgement piece is really huge. So for some kids that maybe, you know, that um, uh, are being referred to by this question, to just say, 
okay, why don't you step back for a minute from the unit work that we're all doing um, and do something, whether it's art or journaling, you know, where you can just write down, you know, where they're worried about the world, you know, is this the, you know, when's the next pandemic going to be? What is this, you know, what does this mean for, you know, all, for all of the countries who don't have, you know, access to means to, to and be safe and have masks and, they're worried about all of the other people in the world and all the other big domino effect issues. And maybe they just need to get that out. Maybe they need to have a Zoom call with three other kids mm -hmm. who maybe they're 10, but they're also worried about those same things and they need to talk about it. So acknowledgement, I think is a big piece. And also for the teachers, I would just say, also give yourself a break. You know, all kids are missing academic learning from last spring. Um, so your, you know, even your, your fastest learners and your most gifted thinkers, you know, aren't going to be where your kids usually are this time of year. And that's okay. I, I, it's not what we want it to be, but that's the way it is. And to give yourself a break for that, I think is, um, is something that's really important for teachers as well to change those expectations in the light of what we can do right now. Yeah, I do way worse work with kids if I don't forgive myself. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's good to keep in mind. Um, it seems like we also have a few parents in the audience today. Um, so do you have any suggestions for parents who are new to gifted education, um, resources or books or just general advice? Ooh, yeah, I, I think we list some resources. I mean, I know we do in the book itself. Um, lots of books at Proofrock Press are great. And um, you know, out there in the world, there is a lot of good information. I was mentioning my daughter uh, early and it really was, you know, I didn't have the vocabulary for a lot of what she was presenting as she was growing up and I wish I had had it. So to, you know, to be some, a parent who is here at a Proof Rock Zoom, that is a great start. You know, I, I wasn't doing that also, it was so long ago. I don't think we had this kind of technology, but um, yeah, to just arm yourself with information and, and, and phrases, you'll be nodding your head a lot as you le read books. Molly, what do you say? You have little kids at home right now. Yeah, I would say actually some of the same advice that we would give either new teachers or teachers new to the, the field of gifted education or um, which is first of all, you know, track down some reliable state-based resource resources. You could go to the, the DOE website and, you know, figure out um, if they have um, information on giftedness on their website, or you can even call and inquire of, you know, who, who to connect with. Um, if there are state organizations, they'll direct you there um, if you're not sure how to find them otherwise. Actually, if you go on the website of the National Association for Gifted Children, NAGC, they actually have a list of state organizations, too. You can search by state. And that's great. I mean, our local organization, the Maine Educators of the Gifted and Talented, has conferences every year, and they're not just for teachers. So, you know, parents can go to conferences. I think that's a great way to inform yourself of best practices, local, you know, local um, programs and procedures and to connect with other people who could arm you with helpful information. Um, and also obviously to partner with the schools, go to them, start the conversation, say, I want to be your partner and, um, advocate in a really positive way for my child. Mm -hmm. You know, do you have resources for me? Can you direct me to, to information? Um, there's lots of great books out there, you know, as Charlotte said through, you know, proof rock, especially because of that's their specialty is, you know, there's, you know, books called like Giftedness 101, you know, I mean, there's, you know, a lot of introductory. Um, well, now know, that you mentioned that, <laughs> I just had that up, just coincidentally. <laughs> So yeah. the, this is uh, uh, Gifted 101 is uh, Parenting Gifted Kids 101 is fantastic. But actually, you know what, if, if any of you parents go to the Proofrock web, website and just come down to Parenting Gifted Children, we have, uh, we have over 28 different books that are fantastic. Uh, now, some of them sort of take a, uh, like look at uh, emotional intensity among gifted students or uh, might look at, uh, uh, a book like Letting Go of Perfect, which is- Oh, that's a great book. About, I love right. that book. I did a whole workshop on it for teachers. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Um, thanks. <laughs> and, I really also think that parents have to know that you know your kid best. You know, even though you need vocabulary, you might not understand some aspects of GT and as you know your kid best. So armed with information and a deep knowledge of your child and, and, and their needs, you, you can, like Molly was saying, be their 
best ally and, and, and don't be afraid to advocate. Uh, educational, you know, public schools are amazing. I'm a lifelong public school teacher, but, and, all, and other schools are, are amazing too, but they can't be the whole solution. Yeah, yeah, and I would just give one more um, great resource that we constantly go to is, is SANGS, um, yeah. supporting the emotional needs of the gifted, um, or uh, social emotional needs of the gifted. And, and it's a great, um, SANG is a great website because there's tons of articles on everything from twice exceptionality to um, asynchrony, perfectionism, you know, all the social pieces that, that parents see a lot more of at home. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe, you know, that um, they're trying to understand. And that's a great resource. It's a good one, too. Yeah. Stephanie, I, I'm afraid uh, we're at the four o'clock, so we're at the hour. And I, 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 I typically like to, because I know we've got busy parents and, and teachers in the audience, we try to limit it to an hour long. But uh, Stephanie, maybe one more question, and then, and, then, uh, and then we'll close up. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so for our last question, what is your best advice or tools for motivating the unmotivated gifted student? The underachievers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, there, again, I would go back to Joel's question about, you know, how do you modify work? It, it depends on the child. You know, and the first thing I try to figure out is why are they unmotivated? Why are they underachieving? Is it because um, no one said to them before, I notice you and your gift and your gifts and abilities um, so that they've spent however many years, six, eight, 10 in school, um, really bored because the material is so unchallenging for them? Um, you know, or is it because they're in one of these subgroups um, that are at risk? You know, maybe their brain is just full of the fact that they're homeless right now and that's their priority. <laughs> um, you know, or, you know, is it because um, there is something going on in their personal or emotional lives that's keeping them from achieving those really um, sensitive, sensitive and emotional kids right now um, during the pandemic? maybe underachieving because they're so hyper-focused on worrying about their family, the world. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I, I think starting by trying to find out, maybe through conversations, talking to parents, other teachers who work with this child, who teachers who had the child last year, trying to figure out as much as you can about them to figure out maybe why they're underachieving and um, mm -hmm. will be helpful because then you can figure out, okay, if they're bored, then I can create more appropriate work for them that's very challenging. Hey, okay. um, if, you know, if they're worried, maybe they need to be invited to do some journaling to talk to other kids who are also concerned, you know, and you can figure out how to reach out to them. That is a deeply sane analysis, Molly, and I thank you for it. And I would just add to that, that my big allies are, are the power of the random and the power of art. They're like doors kids can walk through. If you do maybe synectics, which is a really fun sort of mashing up to just to un, basically if you think of a log jam which could be why kids are stuck how do you unstick that sometimes it is the power of the random or or the power of art and i don't mean just visual art so those are good allies in in this and i would just uh, say one more piece is just also some kids need permission to step away from all the requirements all the homework all the classwork maybe just for two days or a week, just because they're really overwhelmed by all the expectations on themselves right now, um, and maybe other things at home that are their responsibilities that they're unable to achieve at the level of which you know that they can. Mm -hmm. And so to be to say, you know what, um, it, it don't do the assignments this week for me instead, could we just have a conversation conversation check in, and it won't your grades won't be affected. Don't you know, don't worry about it. Sometimes kids need that break. And that could we, we can just end by saying, you know, we're all humans and, and now more than ever, human to human stuff just is what we all need. And as Joel said, when he showed, you know, our contact information, I know there's people who had questions that we didn't get to it, but Charlotte and I really would enjoy communicating with people. Feel free to email us if you have other questions we didn't touch on. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It was great. Oh, you guys are so gracious. I tell you what I'll do. When I send out the certificates of attendance, I'll include your email address in that in that that email so that if people, because we didn't get, we had so many questions, we didn't get to all of them. And I apologize to the folks that we didn't get to. Uh, but but you'll have an opportunity to correspond if, 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 if you guys want to continue that conversation. Let me 
let me first thank everyone who attended today. I know that this is uh, uh, stressful and everything's been topsy-turvy in, in schools. And so that you guys came today uh, was just, I'm just so gratified. So thank you to the audience for, for uh, attending. Uh, Stephanie McCauley, our education editor here in Austin, Texas, thank you for coming in and handling the Q&A. Yeah, this is great. Thanks so much. And, and finally, Charlotte Agel and Molly Kellogg. Thank you guys for coming and being such wonderful guests today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you, right. everybody. Great. Yeah, bye-bye, everybody. I had such a great time.